But uh, one of the issue uh, for France is that you know they've been in the region for many years, and we're not only talking about you know after the post Gaddafi uh, fall and all the chaos that it brought in the region, but for many years, and keep saying that the country is poor. If you've been in the region for you know 60, 70 years, still saying that the country is poor, poor despite the fact that they produce so much uh, in terms of raw material for France, then you know definitely there's something wrong. Someone is not paying the rent that they should be paying. And that is what is called the anti-French sentiment. It's, it's not necessarily anti-French sentiment against the French people, but rather against the political elite that allow the exploitation without a fair share of return within the country. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to Dr. Jonathan Hamisi, who received his PhD in Economic Geology and Geochemistry earlier this year from Australia's Monash University. Uh, Jonathan, congratulations on that one. It's always a big step. Um, Thank you, Pascal. So Jonathan currently lives in Sweden, but he is a Congolese national. He was born and grew up in the Democratic Republic of Congo, studied there in uh, Lubumbashi, the second largest city of the country, and he worked in the mining industry around there for seven years before going back to academia. Jonathan, Jonathan reached out to me because he rightly pointed out the important connection between great power politics and mineral resources. As we all know, much of the past 600 years of international relations have been the story of European colonial exploitation of other reg regions, the African continent has most egregiously been attacked and plundered, first for its human resources and for the slave trade, and later for its mineral wealth, either directly through the colonial apparatus or after the 1960s through neocolonial practices. Uh, that allowed for the continent's robbery, really, of African wealth the entire time. So that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for joining me today. Yeah, thank you, Pascal. So, Jonathan, uh, maybe let's start a little bit with your background and your home. You are from the yep. Democratic Republic of Congo and you studied in a mining town. How did you come to work in the mineral resource sector? How does that sector influence the Congo? And uh, is the West today still exploiting your home country for its mineral wealth? Uh, yeah, so I am born and raised in uh, Obumbashi which is uh, a city in the Katanga region, the main town. I'm originally from Eastern Congo, from, from the Kivus. Uh, it's probably very well known uh, nowadays for the conflicts happening, but it's a very beautiful region, um, mountains. Uh, the big gorillas, those who have heard about the silverbacks, uh, they are native from that region. Uh, I went to university in Lubumbashi, and I guess the choice of my studies was also very much influenced by uh, what uh, was powering the economy in the region, which is basically the mine. Those very familiar uh, probably know about the state-owned mining company called Jekka Mine, which used to be one of the largest mining company uh, in, in, in Africa, really, uh, at the end of the 1800 and uh, the beginning until the, the 1960s and 70s. Uh, the mining industry plays a big role in the economy. When uh, the Congo became a, um, well, first of all, after the 1885, the Berlin Conference became the property of um, the King Leopold II. Uh, the very first geologists who did a trip in the Congo, uh, particularly in the Katanga region, came up with this expression that people still use today, saying the Congo was a geological scandal, because uh, unlike other regions in the world where deposits were most of the time deep-seated underground, a lot of the copper, gold, cobalt deposits were just outcropping out there. So you didn't really need to be an expert to, uh, to discover uh, or deposit at the time when uh, all this deposit had not been exploited uh, that much, even by uh, the native, even though there was a very low level of um, uh, 
copper mining already before uh, before colonization. So the, the the Congo always has been rich of these minerals, and then I mean this was one of the main reasons why also the Belgians then exploited it very much, right? And they were extremely brutal in getting the, in, in in getting these um, these metals. But um, do you today still feel the the repercussions of that? And it, did did this also lead to geopolitical problems inside the Congo? Yeah. I guess to put things in context, we can go back as far as, you know, the 1500s. We can go back as far as that to understand what, uh, uh, why the situation that we have today is as it is today. So you go from a very long period of slave trades between the 1500s to the 1800s, where basically man power was the most important resources to uh, transform energy into work, so to get goods and any other item that we have. And from the 1700s, during the onset of the um, Industrial Revolution, so James Watts, the, the, the British, that's when you really start to have a um, extended and widespread use of metals. And it has a particular period of time that um, mineral resources became really important. Uh, and then you enter the period of colonization at the end of the 1800s until the 1960s. In actual fact, if you look at how much metals have been used during the past, uh, during the past century, we have used a lot more metal than during the entire existence of the human species on Earth, only during the past 100 years. And this was really powered by the Industrial Revolution. The increase in the use of, of metal or other mineral resources increased exponentially. And at every single stage of the um, Industrial Revolution, so going from the steam engine and then uh, coal, and then you went to oil and nuclear today, and today we are now transitioning to um, what we call uh, the, the, the energy transition where we do need those metals that we call green metals. So during, if you, so the first, the slave trade, terrible human records, uh, indespicable, and then you enter into the colonization era in the 1800s, at the end of the 1800s, also very terrible records. Um, those who have read um, Joseph Conrad's The Art of Darkness, uh, who was a, I think, a New York Times columnist and writer, and wrote about, he was supposed initially to do a mission to uh, write or glorify how good the Belgian colonization was. But after witnessing what he has seen uh, in the Congo under the King Leopold II, he was he was shocked and couldn't write anything about painting in the right way, uh, colonization. Uh, it was a time where um, rubber was one of the most important commodity, ivory and rubber. With the development of the uh, vehicles, rubber became a very important commodity for uh, making tires. And uh, the King Leopold II literally plunders the country for Contrary to what uh, there was in North and South America, where rubber was mostly plantation in the Congo, we had wild rubber, which was basically just growing in the forest. And it was the case in a number of um, Western and Central African countries where there was just wild rubber that was just ready to be harvested. Uh, it is estimated that during the tenure of King Leopold, about half of the population was decimated because there was punishment for anyone who wasn't able to um, collect the daily quota that they had. So the number are estimated around 10 million people. So that's a little bit of the background of how we went from slavery and then colonization uh, or pre-colonization, colonization time, and then post-colonization. And in the post-colonization era, so you go from uh, the, the colonies that had basically um, Corporation that's at their headquarter in the colony, uh, in the in the um, colonizer countries, and all the activities in the colonies. 
you move from that to the post-colonial era where now the Congolese try to take over back of the national resources. And that's translated into the nat nationalization of all the assets uh, from the uh, colonizers' corporation, which um, did not necessarily result into a positive outcome also for the local population because of multiple reasons. So it went from either the inexperience uh, of the people who took over, either because of literally a continuity of uh, the colonization, because the people who took over were basically puppets of the colonizers, and also basically the lack of vision or, or, or the lack of plan, simply. So one thing that you said is quite important to understand, right? The, I mean, all of this is important to understand, but the, the, I would like to stress this one because I was also not aware of that. When the Europeans in South America, they went there often to get gold. They had this gold rush, right? And these, these idea, first the Spanish, but then also others. Uh, yeah, uh, went the there British, the French. But that yeah. was not driven by the idea of getting rare earths to do something with them. Uh, sorry, to get minerals to do something with them. That was purely for... Uh, well, monetary reasons, right? Because everybody traded those, so they had they had they had some value, monetary value. But for Africa, that was not the case. It was it was first labor, then a bit of rubber to be to be used, yep. and then now um, the metals that are used in in our in industrial production. So that's kind of a a, di a different setting, right? From let's say South America. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you go first from manpower, and then you start going into the raw material parts which basically lasts until today. So, and even today, a lot of the uh, minerals that modern economies need in order to function properly, in order to power our phones and computers and uh, and so on, are actually located in very specific areas and, and many of them in, in Africa. So it's not just that, you know, we have sometimes this image that uh, minerals or so in Africa are mostly like, okay, let's say, um, diamonds or something. Okay, I know it's not, not a good example. Diamonds are are being extracted because they're valuable uh, on trade and they they end up in luxury materials and uh, uh, in luxury goods uh, and mm. so on. But uh, so for the Congo, the issue is and 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 other countries that there's there's companies that want to exploit these minerals to then use them in in uh, in production chains. Is that fair to say? Yeah, so um, at the end of the Second World War mm. and until the 1960s, which is a period from where a lot of African countries started to get their independence, the former colonizer then understood that to continue to develop their industry, they needed to have access to metals and minerals. And a lot of those metals and minerals unfortunately were not found in well in europe most of the time because a lot of the colonizers were african empires or africa uh, or european uh, empires or european countries but in south america there were large metal deposits in north america in africa in southeast asia and in australia and that is basically just due to the geology so it has nothing to do, and the geology basically has no boundaries. Uh, or deposits can be split in between the boundaries of two countries. So understanding the needs of metal to continue to develop their industry, if you want to keep doing that, you still need to have access to those metals. But now, how to do it when you have lost grip on the former colony became the challenge. So, and the African leaders who took over uh, during the post-colonial era, they also understood that there would be some sort of interdependence because even though the African countries were prepared for extraction, a lot of them basically lacked a plan for industrialization, which is the next step after extracting. So you extract and then you process and then you manufacture. A lot of the countries basically due to 
the politics of the colonization because it was never a plan to develop locally. It was more extracting the resources. A lot of the countries were very much prepared for extraction, but not for the rest of the chain value. And that problem somehow continued today. And that's why the trade relationship between the producers and the buyers, it's still basically the same. There is a very low to little level of manufacturing and processing uh, in uh, in Africa or South uh, or South and um, back in the South in South America than there are, for example, nowadays in uh, in North America, in Europe, and and China. All that also went very fast into transforming their um, economy from just being a warehouse to now processing and innovation. Yes, and I I know that you also. Part of what you studied and study is also the economic aspect of how then the how the mineral trade and so on works, um, mm -hmm. and, and raw materials resources in general. Because like the yeah. Western Europe has been very good at exploiting all of these things that that only grow in Africa. I mean, I'm from Switzerland. We are famous for yeah. our chocolate. Guess how many chocolate, how many cocoa trees you have in Switzerland? Zero. <laughs> but yeah. we get all of that from from uh, from where? Ivory Coast, I would guess. Ivory Coast. Ghana yep. and Ivory Coast, and then process it, and that's where the most mm -hmm. of the profit actually ends up, right? It doesn't end exactly it doesn't end on Ivory Coast. So, how did they do it with the Congo, and what is the economic mechanism that was used in order to make sure that Africans get stuck on the on the losing end of the bargain? Yeah, I will be, before explaining how we get stuck at the losing end. I will take a concrete example, and I think you gave a very good example about one you know raw material that is cacao that is produced in Ivory Coast and then the chocolate is done in Switzerland. So I have crunched the number of a number of commodities in different countries and not only in the Congo. So if you take you take the example of cobalt for example as a metal that is used to power batteries but it is also used in um, uh, super alloy for, for jet, jet engi engines uh, for the defense industry. So let's take the example of a cell phone. Uh, if you take one iPhone, that will have a few grams of cobalt. Yes. So you produce your one kilo or one tons of cobalt in the Congo. And then that cobalt is um, processed at a very low level in the Congo. So you produce a concentrate, which is then sold to a, a factory in China most of the time. And the Chinese factory produced the battery, and then the battery goes to iPhone, Huawei, Samsung, and so on. When you calculate the cost of production for per kilo, and you compare it to how much revenue in the end comes back to the Congo, it's about 2.5% that comes back to the Congo. So 97.5% of the revenue of that one kilo sold remains somewhere in other countries. And you can do the calculation for a number of commodities. Some rounded up to three or 3.5, for example, for cobalt. But according to my calculation, I fall just below three. And you can do that for a number of commodities and you still go back to about the same number. Somewhere between two to 10% of the revenue for a particular commodity is the money or the profits that comes back to the country which basically means the country remains stuck in that extracting uh, parts of the industry and never really gets to uh, increase their profit and revenue to allow them to now develop the industry, the next part of the chain supply. Why is it that, the, let's take the Congo, why did the Congo not, not develop its own indigenous kind of... Uh, uh infrastructure not not infrastructures or industry i want to say to actually mm -hmm. um make more out of the cobalt and other minerals uh, than mm -hmm. just you know taking them out of the ground and sh shipping them out of the country right uh, there is mm -hmm. there is a, a structural element to that and yeah we have seen countries that have zero zero natural wealth Mm -hmm. except beyond maybe a little bit of geography, let's take Singapore, no natural yeah. wealth, nothing. But they managed to go to like extreme heights by being 
uh, by being very, very good at at commanding like uh, the, the 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 production of certain things, and you know, um, uh, oil refineries and so on have, have always played a, a a pretty big role. Why is it that the Congo didn't develop industry? Yeah. So there are multiple reasons to that, and the issue is for many African countries not only the reason are multiple, but they're also quite complicated, and it's intricate between social, political, and historical. Uh, reasons. Um, so in the Congo, for example, after the uh, when the Congo got independent in 1960, and uh, um, I would say the very first and probably only one really democratic election happened in 1960. Uh, Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba is elected. He comes up with some sort of vision to, okay, now it's time for the country to take back the control to their resources. But he doesn't even stay in power for a year. And unfortunately, at the time, when the Congo got the independence, the number of people who had higher education was about 10, probably even less. So there was already at the very beginning, because it was never a plan for the colonizer that the Congolese would somehow, at some point, take over the industry. So the level of education was kept at the minimum level for the Congolese to be able to do general labor work, but never specializing in industry. But then Lumumba is assassinated, um, and uh, the, the, the different um, intelligence, foreign intelligence services involved, Mobutu takes over. And he leads the country for 32 years, brutal dictator. Uh, and I, I think if I, if I can actually recall some of the statements made by a U.S. ambassador in the Congo, I think it's called Dan Simpson, in 90, it was an ambassador between 95 and, and, and 98. He made a statement saying, brutal, brutally, quote, we have accepted that Mobutu is a bastard, but he is our bastard. Did he say that in, so, in relation to Mobutu? I always thought that was in yeah. relation to Pinochet. In... No, it was in relation to Mobutu. At some point, we have accepted that he's a bastard, but he's our bastard. So basically, the plan was to support the dictator. That the, the Congo sh was to remain a country just producing raw materials for the rest of the world and not developing its own industry. But the, all the blame, to be fair, all the blame cannot only be put on foreign countries. There also has been a very long period of um, where Congolese leader remain basically complacent because they were earning enough money for their own living and their own family. And they, bas they basically simply didn't care. The education system collapsed. And really to destroy a nation is start, if you start by destroying the, 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 the education system, then people remain at a certain level and never really go uh, or never really see further than what they have in front of them. So the collapse of the education system in the Congo combined with corrupt leaders uh, and also co combined basically with extreme poverty has prevented the country to have a, um, a plan or a vision to go from being an extracting region to a processing and industrial power. During the Cold War, you know, the US, Europe were very obsessed with uh, communism, right? And with this idea, oh, this is this epic struggle, blah, 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 blah. And whoever, whoever goes a little bit, a, a little bit left needs to be toppled. I mean, that's why, that's why Pinochet was put into, in, in into power. Or like the same for Lumumba. It's the same for Lumumba. And, um, yes. but do you think was the primary goal of this, of this treatment of the Congo, the preventing a uh, socialist government or a kind of Soviet Union leaning government to come to power, or was the, the extraction of the natural natural wealth of of the Congo um, a driving factor, or was it or was it both? I believe it is both. I think the extraction and the political uh, leaning toward either communism or more Western uh, governance system. Uh, has always been a factor, even before I would say the, the, the before the before the Cold War, so before the World War II. Uh, and I think a, a typical example of um, what's a typical example of the extraction part of things is 
the uranium that we used during the project Manhattan and uh, and ended up in the first two uh, atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The uranium deposit of Shingolobwe was known by the Belgian even before World War One, and when the research starts on uh, uh, on on the, the, the well at the beginning it was more in the nuclear energy and then some other scientists understood that if control the reactions could be used also for atomic bombs the uranium that was used was extracted pre, uh, mainly in the US was extracted mainly in mines in Canada where the grade for uranium was around one percent or less. Well, the uranium that was extracted in uh, in, in the Congo, the Shinkolobwe mine, was up to 20% concentration of uranium in the minerals. So that is a typical example of, you know, we've got this asset, we know it is there, we don't want to lose it, regardless of what happens. And that is also one of the reasons why even during Lumumba's tenure, during, during his, his, six, his six months when he was prime minister, Immediately after it, after when he, he, he took over and took hold in his office, the Katanga region, which is the region known uh, where the copper belt is, uh, uh, is located and known for its mineral wealth, went on a cessation or a breakaway. It became a breakaway region. And the person who became the head of state in that region was supported by the Belgian, the French and the British. So Katanga as a region, the Congo became, well, Lumumba, as you said, uh, and as it was somewhat well known, he was a nationalist. Uh, he never declared publicly that he was, he, he was a communist, but he had contact with the Russians. Um, Lumumba became prime minister, but the Katanga region broke away, broke away almost immediately. And that's the time all the big mines were located in the Katanga region. So it was like, okay, you keep the rest, but the mines are ours. It's such a classic. It's such a classic, and it's a, it's a, it hurts so much because it's so blatant, right? Uh, and yeah. and that was certainly a time when when the West had no problems with breakaway regions as long as they break away to the no, right. To, uh, to totally the, to not. The right totally not. And thinking about it, for me particularly, sitting here in in, in Sweden in Uppsala. Because Dag Amershold was the UN secretary at the time in 1961 right. when the breakaway happened. And he was on his way to the Congo because he was convinced he could strike a deal between the breakaway region and Lumumba as a prime minister. And he actually, from, from historical records, he actually already basically had a paper with a deal. And he was on his way there. But unfortunately, he never made it there because there was never a plan to let the breakaway region to go back to a you know communist government le led by Lumumba, and I'm I'm living very close by to where the the Dynamo Show Foundation is. <laughs> yeah, uh, these the, you know it's not it's not that it's not that the entire it, that the entire West has these nefarious plans. It's just that then that then often the forces that are yeah. that are that, that then lead to violence and that, that use violence very very skillfully that they they tend to win at the end of the day and we have several Swedes who got murdered I mean Olaf Palme uh, was murdered yeah. uh, partially because he was a um he was a critic of that of that uh, of the system of, of abuse um yeah and the parallel can also be made with it, I mean it's not necessarily the primary objective but a parallel can be also made with with the oil in Libya and the mm -hmm. the, the, the 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 murder of uh, of uh, Gaddafi, uh, Colonel Gaddafi. So some of the record that emerged later after the after two thousand and eleven, uh, that some of the the Hillary Clinton emails, some of those emails that emerged later on, well, thanks to WikiLeaks, we found we we now know that there were records of. Uh, former state departments who are working for the Clinton Foundation. I think if I'm not mistaken, the name of the guy is Sidney Blumenthal. He emails Hillary Clinton in April to say, well, the French are not too much interested by, uh, you know, liberating the people of Libya, but they've got potentially secret, secret deal that they will, uh, they will sign for oil. And they are also afraid that the 140 tons of gold that Gaddafi had 
which he was planning to use to back a new currency in West Africa in the replacement of the France EFA, was going to be used for doing that. And then the France, France would sort of somewhat lose, lose grip on those 14 countries that are using the France EFA. I mean, of course, some people would say, well, maybe that would be, you know, it's far-fetched. It's a, it's a level of conspiracy. It might not be the main objective, but the end result, all in all, was meant to prevent those things to happen. And if you look at what happened after that in, uh, in Libya, you ended up with different regions, I think three different regions, uh, I think it's Tripolitania and uh, Cyrenaica and Fiesan, who went to three different generals who had different allegiance. So the, 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 the region where Benghazi was located, Cyrenaica, went to some uh, general who had uh, the back. And, and it's, it's quite really weird because you see great power politics actually working together for their common interests far away from the region. So the guy who took over, the general who took over, I think it's called Gen he's called General Haftar, um, he was supported by Egypt, Syria, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, France, and Russia together. And the general who took over the region of, uh, of uh, the Tripolitania, uh, he was from another coalition called the Government of National Accords. He was supported by the US, Turkey, and the EU as an institution. And France was out of that support. So you can still see that despite having some disagreements in their own region, when the interests are the same, which in Libya was, you know, for some of the, the, the French interests, extracting oil and preventing a gold-backed currency replacing the France EFA. They worked together with countries that, you know, they, they found themselves with very interesting allies in, 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 yeah. uh, for this particular case. Yeah, this is, this is where what you are saying and, uh, or, and studying in, intersects very closely with what, what I'm studying. is like these great powers never have an interest of letting genuine third parties emerge. I mean, uh, having, having a, a, a genuine next power block. So then, then yeah. they start conspiring again in order to make mm -hmm. sure that their common interest, which is keeping that other one down, uh, well, it keeps going, right? So, but yeah. that, and there's this other and maybe thing. Maybe a quick, a quick last example, which is very anecdotic, uh, sorry to interrupt, to, is is Niger, because we're talking about Niger a lot at the moment. Uh, during the uh, during the Bush era, just before the start of the war in Iraq, the US intelligence services claimed that the uranium, that the military grade uranium that was found in, in that was supposedly found in, 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 in Iraq and that was uh, contributing to the development of, of nuclear weapon in Iraq was coming from Niger. And the funny story is that it's a fr it's a French company at the time that was owner of the mine that that uranium was claimed to be coming back, and that's why the French were you know totally opposed to the war because they of course knew that they couldn't have sold the, the uranium to to Iraq and Saddam, so that that was also one of the reasons why the French were just like no this is not true it can't be true we own the mine. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We we've got it. We 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 know who we are selling yeah, to, and he's exactly. not on the he's not on the list. <laughs> yeah, um, he's not, and it can't be. <laughs> um, um, I'll come back to Niger in a moment, but the, yeah. there is this there's this idea, or like let's say in in political in social sciences and international relations, we literally study something that's called the resource curse. And I yes. the, the longer I study this, the more I get the feeling that this is one of these. Uh, kind of BS expressions that we make up in order to kind of justify that the West constantly exploits countries with a lot of resources, because it refers to the fact that all of the countries or places and regions, even within countries that are very rich in minerals and that uh, or or and oil and so on, that they tend to have the poorest populations and the poorest people and they get the least share of that of that wealth that's literally beneath their feet. Jimmy Dore and others keep keep referring to this as how dare these uh, states parking their countries above our assets uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> of, uh, you know, how then exploitation takes place. And, and these these populations are themselves then so disempowered that they they, they work yep. and labor there. They ruin their their health and they get nothing. Um, 
do you do you see that happening structurally still in large parts of the of Congo and 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 Africa t- at the moment, or is that actually getting better? Uh, I would say a lot of efforts are made to to improve the situation, uh, to to make it better. Um, but at the moment, it's still very much. I mean, I will just take the example that I took earlier of cobalt. That is at current day. And that is one commodity. And if you look at the number of countries in Africa where extraction is happening, they've got about the same number of the money that's come back to their country. And the issue itself is not extracting the metals of mineral to sell to other country. It's more if a country is only getting about 2% of the revenue, then it means there's something wrong in the system. Either you know the buyer doesn't pay enough <laughs> Or, or either the country doesn't really understand the value of the mineral that they are producing. I probably would go for you know, a combination of factors, plus the politics in general in those countries. Because if you take the markets of uh, metals and minerals, if you look at the countries that usually buy those commodities, so if you take, for example, the UK, They've got what they call the London Stock Exchange or Metal Exchange, which is basically where commodities uh, are traded. In Australia, they've got something similar. In the US, they've got something similar. In Canada, they've got something similar. But you'll find out that in the African countries where those commodities are coming from, there's basically no metal exchange stock. There's no public market for selling commodities. Yeah. Maybe only in South Africa, and uh, I, I think Nigeria is still at a very embryonary stage. But they're coming back; they're coming up also with something similar. So as long as you don't control the trade of your commodities, it is really hard to make money out of those commodities. Because what happens is you sell those commodities, and most of the time using foreign currency. Of course, it does help the country to bring back uh, reserve uh, of, of currency. Uh, of foreign currency, but at the same time, it weakens your own currency. But if you start producing and then you back your own currency with the raw material that you're producing, that's when you strengthen your own economy rather than bringing in in the country only foreign currency. So the factors that contribute to the... uh, to, to maintain, I would say, African economy to that's one side of the sector where it's only extraction is also the politic that is put in place to regulate the market's commodity or rather the non-existence of political or governance system to regulate uh, the commodity market. Because if you somehow channel the, the sale of the commodity that the country produces, to one big national marketplace, then the buyers are actually buying inside the country, which means instead of exporting only, you know, barely processed yeah. metals, you produce directly the raw material that will be used in the industry or even locally, actually. And maybe you also force, you know, manufacturing, manufacturing companies to come in the country because if they have to export and pay very high duty uh, instead of, you know, producing the room, the the, the components uh, in in, in the country and then sell the final product, then you increase the revenue that you can keep in the country. That would be the the perfect strategy because, okay, there's, there's not only no industry, there's also no marketplace and yeah, uh, and if if there was a marketplace, not only would you would you have like national control over the rules of trade, right? Yep. Uh, you would yep. also have the you would also have the power to mandate that this must be traded in your local currency, which will prop up the currency extremely and 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 have yep. it have it gain in value and therefore more purchasing power abroad. And yep. 
uh, you could you could uh, facilitate um, the transfer of, of of technology transfer, right? Make them make these foreign companies build that here, and then build one uh, an indigenous one next door with like more or less yeah. after after getting the people from there and so on, and 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 develop an industry. But that's not happening, right? That's no. not happening. And the yeah. the West is very good at using actual like IMF and World Bank loans and so on to make sure that there are no that there's no nationalization happening of um of of the whole of the whole tr trade well it's not just the sec the entire sector right no nationalization of the sector and it remains in foreign hands which yeah. which instruments today are the most impeding for like such a national industry like growing growing uh, in in the congo yeah, that's true. Uh, so at the end of the Cold War in the 1990s, uh, it was sort of the end of the large period of nationalization of uh, a lot of the mining company in, the, in, 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 uh, in Africa. So they started to open up to you know, the liberal or free markets. But for those companies now, which you know, a lot of them went bankrupt because of you know, mismanagement or corruption and so on, they to get access to funding from you know either the World Bank or the IMF to sort of reboost and restart production, those countries were basically told very gently that the nationalized companies have to be transformed into commercial entity with you know combined private public shareholders to allow for them to get access to, uh, to funds from the World Bank. And even when access was given to those funds, the interest rates were so high that until today, you know, some of the companies, they haven't really seen their benefit because they're paying very low, very high interest, uh, very high interest to the point where whatever they earn from, you know, the, 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 the products that they sell, it is so low that it represents nothing. It basically contributes to very little to nothing to the to countries' economies. What currencies are those loans usually denominated in? In US dollars. Well, and you don't control <laughs> those. That's why every country exactly. needs you need you need a sovereign yeah. currency. Every country needs a sovereign currency, and you need to be able to force outside players to trade in your in your currency. Otherwise, the others are always gonna gonna take advantage of you. The, a national uh, a sovereign currency that works and is actually traded inside the country is so incredibly important. But you know, yeah. let's let's shift to to another like lovely talking point that Western countries have at the moment because the West <clears throat> keeps warning Africa that the evil Chinese are about to use debt trap policies <laughs> and they just want to extract your wealth and you know not pay you anything and they're horrible and they bring their own workers and they are exploiting Africa the poor Africans those evil Chinese are going to exploit the poor Africans um sorry I, I I just it frustrates me so much um <laughs> the hypocrisy of it all what's what you who has worked in the sector what is what is your assessment of China's involvement in Africa and what's the impact of that are you uh, do, is there a, a a chance of ex of getting more from trade with China, or is it the same in a different different color? Mm. I guess when one talks to China, particularly in the mining industry, we, we should break it down in three different entities. You've got China as the China state, so state-owned company that signs deal with countries. And then you also have Chinese private company that also sign deals with countries. And then the third group is also private, but it's more, I would say, the cowboys, you know, the, the ones who come with no plan or no project. They just want to buy and leave. Mm. So you've got those three entities, sometimes working together and sometimes actually working against each other. There's, because there's, there's still also competition with the Chinese. But let's focus on China as a country because it's probably the biggest player uh, when it comes to uh, you know, loans that are... Um, loans that are going to uh, most of the time it's infrastructure projects uh, in, in, in African countries. Well, yes, of course, there is that reputation. China really only became, to, became or started to become a big player in the beginning or mid 2000s, because before then, you know, China was still this sort of very big warehouse of the world, but the really big work on, you know, 
innovation industrialization and i uh, and technological products is is quite re it's the past 20 25 years and it went really fast so if you look at china as um as a country yes there are deals that are signed which one would say are very unbalanced because basically what happened is that countries decide to um give certain mining licenses to Chinese state-owned companies to do exploration and then mining in exchange to infrastructure projects on which there is a number. But you don't really know the number on the mining assets until exploration has been done. So uh, in that case, you, you have a very unbalanced deal, but it is unbalanced on both sides because there is so much uncertainty. To give an example, when you do exploration for mining, at today's um, statistics, only one out of 100 exploration projects turn out to be a mine. So it's, it's also very risky. So if you have 100 exploration projects, only one usually end up being a mine, which means the state's own company, the Chinese state owned company, also take a risk because they might do exploration even though most of the time they would want to have mining license where you know the assets are relatively uh, well known, but it's still risky on both sides. And that's why they typically would have clauses to, in case there is impairment, to find and somewhat try to somehow try to find the balance. The big difference now with China and um, uh, and I would say the loans that are given by the World Bank, is that the conditions are not the same. Typically, the Chinese, they would start the, the infrastructure project almost immediately by the signature of the deal, even if they, you know, basically a, a, a government, an African government will come with a dark bag where there is uh, a small uh, a small felon. You don't know if it is a cat or if it is a tiger. And you need to do exploration to find out if this project is actually big. And sometime while you find out, actually, you know, the Chinese company found out that they've been given a cat. It's not a tiger. And then they have to sign another deal or another mining license. But typically, they would immediately start with the infrastructure project on the other side without preconditions. Now, when you go on the IMF and the World Bank side, it usually comes with a lot of precondition. You know, restructuring, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, there are usually typically a lot of um, uh, review on the the fund through which uh, the channel through which the fund will go uh, anti corruption and so on, which may take actually even longer than when the actual infrastructure project starts, which makes feel to many people like okay we've signed this deal three years later the project still haven't started. But at the same time, the Chinese have started to build by year number one, they've started to build the infrastructure project and it has already got into operation and it's somewhat into production because people are using that infrastructure. Three years later, while people are other, other people are still waiting for the World Bank project. And that gives this impression that, well, we're lagging the fits behind because there's so many conditions that are imposed to us by this Bretton Woods institution while the Chinese have already started their project, which for many people, many politicians, because they are working on a five to four years period mandate, and they want to see things coming out of the ground before the next election. So you end up in the situation where it, it could be 50-50. Maybe the, the World Bank project is more beneficial regardless of the, of the, of the interest rate on the long run, but you have this politician who is looking at the election in the next two years. And he's got Chinese machinery waiting at the border to start to build on the deal that he has signed yesterday. So of course they will go directly with, with, with the Chinese. And it is not necessarily always a, uh, a debt trap because as I say, the interest rates, because of the risk factor in countries, in a lot of African countries, the interest rate is generally really high. And you may actually end up in a debt trap going with the Bretton Woods institution rather than going with the Chinese. So it's it's more a case-by-case case, uh, thing. It's not. I wouldn't say it is it is uh, systematic 
on one side like on the other side. And you know, the reason why a lot of countries, African countries, remain in debt to the Bretton Woods institution was because they actually ended up in a debt trap. And that wasn't the Chinese. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which is <laughs> And which they is know the system. And that's why they're making this yeah. claim that it is a it, death trap, because they it, know the system. It's usually projection. The West usually complains yeah. about stuff that it has been doing for 200 years, and then it complains that somebody else might do the same, although it, they, they usually don't. Um, yeah. The question, so, yeah. one more connected question, and then we move on, is like, do the Chinese, when they make contracts, also try to influence... Uh, legislation, because the West does that a lot, right? Saying like, okay, we give you these, these and these deals, but we wish uh, judicial reform or whatever it is, or we wish that that adjudication happens outside of the country because we don't trust your judicial system. Do the, Chine do the Chinese do the same? I think the, Chi the Chinese are usually not interested in domestic politics. They're more interested in economy and trade. So in the deal, there might be clauses like, you know, this particular assets or, or commodities, if there is any discovery by a government agency, we want to be the first to be informed and see if you know we can develop the project or not. But the domestic policies, which have a relationship to judicial system, uh, other you know legislative or or or, 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 or economy reform they usually don't go for any sort of clauses to uh, influence them. They are definitely a lot more interested by trade rather mm -hmm. than by trying to change the society in whichever country where they operate. Okay, and more they, and that's, that's, yeah, that's sort of what's also pushed a lot of countries or a lot of uh, African leaders toward the Chinese because they don't feel that there will be this pressure for them to... Uh, uh, to implement uh, some sort of reform in the country that maybe the people may not necessarily want. Right. Um, let's move to the this question also of Niger, and because we want to talk about this connection between, of, of minerals and geopolitics, and we all know that by now that in Niger, uh, France basically gets all of its uranium from, and it basically doesn't pay any of its fair share to, to Niger. I mean, Niger is the second po poorest country in the world, and it has been a, a, a neo-colony of the French for the longest time. Now, there were, this coup happened. I mean, several former French colonies were had were now couped, and military leaders came up who said, like, no more. This is it. We're, we're, ditching, we're ditching France. And we know that there was talk about an invasion, right? And and also ECOWAS being, uh, I mean, should have yep. been instrumental in actually using military force to bring this back under con under control. And Emmanuel mm -hmm. Macron was very strong on that, but it didn't happen. So it looks as if though this is this is being this is this is changing now. The French have, are officially withdrawing their troops. The Americans don't. The Americans keep their people. They are bringing even more people in there. Um, how is the geopolitical landscape and and of, and the mineral wealth of these countries now changing. Yeah, and the case of Niger is very interesting. And, you know, it is another of these cases we just talked about, Santam Grit, uh, Grit's power politics, uh, fighting each other when the, their interests uh, are not met, even in, even in a foreign, in a foreign context. So the case of Niger is very interesting because you have the French that are strongly opposed to anything that is happening at the moment in the leadership in Niger, even though, you know, the, and even though the army is leaving, but Orano, which is the uranium company um, that extracts uh, uranium in Niger, they, you know, they remain, they haven't cut, they have a, they haven't cut any, uh, any, any ties uh, with Niger. And I don't think that will happen. Uh, about a third of the uranium uh, that Fr of, Fr of France needs comes from Niger. So cutting that third will be uh, detrimental uh, on the economical side. Uh, so they know that they have the economic interests and therefore at the moment they're playing low profile. Uh, the American really haven't really played side. They, they haven't really taken sides. Uh, and uh, going back to, um, I think I've mentioned um, uh, Dan Simpson uh, earlier, he's a very interesting character because in relation to the Congo, when 
President Kabila was taking go was was taking over from Mobutu, who was a two thirty two years dictator. American mining company had started to deal with Kabila, who was still a rebel. It wasn't even a government. Who was still a rebel group. American companies started to sign deal with him because they started to feel that the wind was changing. And going back to Dan Simpson, he also made another statement, which is you deal with uh, what the power states be or the one that you think will be. And mm. I think at the moment it is still unclear. We don't know what the power of states will be. So they try to play a balance. They haven't really taken, you know, they haven't made very strong statement as uh, as France, France has done. So I think they're still looking at hanging on the balance and see what the next six months or 12 months will give and then maybe take a stronger position by then. But uh, one of the issues uh, for France is that, you know, they've been in the region for many years and we're not only talking about, you know, after the posts, uh, Kadavi fall and all the chaos that it brought in the region, but for many years, and keep saying that the country is poor. If you've been in the region for you know 60, 70 years, still saying that the country is poor, poor despite the fact that they produce so much uh, in terms of raw material for France, then you know definitely there's something wrong. Someone is not paying the rent that they should be paying, and that is what is called the anti-French sentiment. Is it's not necessarily anti-French sentiment against the French people, but rather against the political elite that allow the exploitation without a fair share of return within the country. Um, and that has been, I think, missed, in, in, my, in my opinion, misused quite a lot to say anti-French sentiment and now uh, the Russian sentiment, because I don't think the people in Niger or in Mali or Burkina Faso are interested to swapping one master for another. What they want is for the country to benefit for from the you know either the natural resource that they have. They want they want schools. They want decent housing. They want you know the basic public services. Uh, than anyone gets, but translating that, that, but they are expressing it against France because they say, well, you've been living with us in this house for so many years, yeah. but nothing is happening. And you've been extracting and taking the resources to, uh, for, you know, for your industry. But yet, when we look around us, there's no industry. So, and that is that feeling of rejection not of the French people, because the French people are still safe to go around in Nigeria and Mali, but the elite is being rejected because of that. And that would make a lot of sense. I just, I'm, I'm constantly reminded that the many problems in developing countries is not that they're underdeveloped, but overexploited. And the, yeah. the, there's just too much taken out and at the same time these countries then tickle in um uh, aid right foreign aid yeah. and, and they build in the schools and then that makes the that makes them feel very good about themselves and it's like, oh my god this school was built with french money and so on yeah and then yeah. while well, a french company takes out a hundred times the value of exactly. what they build yeah. through, the, through, yeah. these, uh, through these minds but um, maybe to end on a on on one more aspect that you pointed out in an email exchange is that uh, Africa, not not just Africa, but but focusing on minerals and the the role minerals play in modern uh, uh, um, production chains. Uh, yeah. also tells us something about what is theater in international relations and what's not, because you yeah. were saying that this trade dispute between China and the US uh, is a mm -hmm. bit like, like disputing between, okay, uh, or is, is like saying that one has the bullet, the other one has the gun, but we need to hunt the same animal. Uh, can yeah. you explain that? And why is it that minerals play such a crucial role in maybe even mm -hmm. stabilizing the international system? Yeah. Uh, the, the... The, 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 the simple reason is that a lot of the metals or what is called crit critical metals or minerals are concentrated in a, in a small 
um, in, in small areas in the world, in some very specific country. So if you take, for example, um, uh, if you take metals like lithium, cobalt, nickel, the World Bank predicts that they, their demand will increase by about 500% by okay. 2050. If you take metals like, uh, um, which other metal are about to increase that much? Um, well, the energy system itself is about to increase by sixfold. And that's a report that was released last year by the International Energy Agency. So you will need energy metals. And you don't find all those metals in every single country. If you take metals like lithium, there are three main producers in the world. I think it's Argentina, um, Argentina, Australia, uh, what's the other country? I think Chile or, or, or Peru. If you take cobalt, 70% of the production comes from one country, it comes from the Congo. If you take nickel, it's only a handful of countries. The rare earth metal, actually today, as of today, the EU depends 100% from rare earth metals from China. So we are in a situation where the problem we have to deal with are global issues, which cannot be solved by one country. And really the only one way is to collaborate. Of course, there can be statement and political postures, but in the end, if we all want to you know, survive and go through what we call the energy transition and transitioning effectively, we need each other's industry. And if we don't collaborate, then as I said, you know, you will have, you either have the ballot or you have the gun, but you can't shoot because you're not talking to the guy who's got the ballot or the guy who's got the gun to make it happen. Can you talk a little bit more why China, the, the rare earths that China has, why those are, those are indispensable for, for the economic future? Because I think that's a real issue because the, the, the US and, and Europe and Japan are trying to kind of cut uh, China out of the, especially the chips production market. They, especially yeah. and the Japanese are very good at producing chips, uh, a very, I mean, very, very expensive chips and very highly developed. And this is something that China at the moment to this, this degree can do yet. Uh, the lithography, uh, uh, um, Technology seem, seem, seems not to be on, on, on the same standard yet. But at, that, mm -hmm. at the same time, China has certain earths that nobody else has. So what are those earths and, and how is China using them at the moment or could use them in order to influence this development? Yeah. So if you look at the periodic table, so you will typically have, you know, an arrow that draws down a list of elements that is usually put at the bottom there. Mm. Those are called the rare earth metals. And it is those metals that are used in um, in modern technology today in the super magnets for, um, uh, for uh, aeolian energy, for windcraft. It is also that that is used in, uh, I've got a former colleague who used to call that, uh, it's, vi it's vitamins for new technology. It's, it's the, those metals that you also use to make the, you know, the, the colors in your screen very nice and very glowy. And they've got this property that are quite particular that allows to reduce the uh, size of whatever component it is made in to a very, very, very small size. And that's why it's, you know the chips are called microchips. But now we're getting to even smaller size. We're getting to, um, to, to, to nano chips. So China produces or process about 92% of uh, the rare earth metals and basically all the countries are buying from them and talking about the relationship with Japan there was already in 2010 a dispute between China and Japan and China cuts Japan from uh, the rare earth metal trade for, for a little while and the, the dispute was resolved now the issue is because we use those, met those particular metal in what is meant to become the future of the energy uh, systems uh, in general. So not having a good relationship in China expose you to risk of the supply being cut. Critical, what are called critical metals are defined by two criteria. It's the risk supply uh, and the economic importance. So for metals like rare earth metals, the risk supply, the supply risk index is, is very big. 
Uh, the one way to avoid risk supply is to diversify uh, your pool of um, your, your pool of buying. But there are metals for which it's almost impossible to do so. And rare, rare earth metal is one of them. And yes, China has used that as leverage uh, to obtain lifting for uh, sanctions here and there. And every now and then they pull out that, uh, that threat when, for example, uh, you know, we're talking about now the, the microchip and uh, the US, uh, Japan and Taiwan trying to prevent China <laughs> to develop the new uh, you know, microchip or to, the, to expand this microchip industry. Uh, but China has been building also its own microchip uh, uh, industry. It's probably not as big as in as it is in Taiwan or in Japan, but China has made actually a lot of progress. Uh, I think a, a, a very recent example of how much China has progressed when it comes to the to the to the chips is that they had produced one of these new um, nano chip that was presented in the US as you know military grade. Uh, nano chip that was meant to be used for defense industry. Well, they've produced one of those and they've put it in the new Huawei, and it's available to the public. It's not military grade for for China. It's you know they've put they put the nano chip in the Huawei. So yeah, the the microchip uh, industry uh, and the direct link to the rare earth metals is going to play really when it comes to trade and technology. It's going to play really a big role um, for relationship between the rest of the world and China, unless the supply can be diversified. Yeah. You you used the word process when we talked about uh, China controlling 92% of rare earth, well, trade. So does China yeah. control, Is are these rare earths in China or was China just fast enough to kind of go around the world and make sure that it all goes through them? So the the ninety two percent that I mentioned, yes, it's the processing. Part of it is produced in China, but not all of it. But even countries that produce them, because the technology, the the, the rare earth metal, it's a bunch of metals for which you need to that you need to separate sometime one after the other, depending on the technology you use. So if you have twenty elements inside a you know inside a, a bunch of, of rare earth and basket. mineral. Yeah. Mm. Yes, exactly. The technology, the costs, plus the environmental considerations are quite important. And China is one of those countries that have been able to develop the technology to do that processing, even though I would say the environmental cost of it is really high. Uh, there are some countries, I think it's Malaysia, that's also used to process rare earth metals. Uh, mostly from Australian mines, but they don't they don't accept anymore to take them because the environmental impact is so huge that they basically just said no. Uh, but yeah, China has been able to to develop techniques to extract different metals, uh, and somehow uh, I wouldn't say perfectly minimize environmental impact. Still quite high. If you look at some of the old mines, not the recent ones. But the old mine with processing plants, you look at the, you can look at that on the, on Google Map. I mean, it looks like a desert. It's, it's catastrophic. And one of the reasons why, also besides the development of technology, that you know, European countries do not have the uh, facilities to do the processing is that. Environmentally, it just would be unacceptable. No one yeah. would want to be to be living next to that. But we still need the metals anyway. Mm. So it's sort of like exporting the environmental problem in China, but also exposing yourself to a risk supply. So Interesting. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's difficult. The not in my backyard <laughs> issue, and that actually then giving yeah. a, a competitive advantage to China where you can do it. Um, very last question. Um, Right now, um, we are recording this on uh, October 11th. The war between Israel and Palestine has just started. And that war is like, in a sense, very, very classical because it's about land and people who live on, on, on lands and, and religious denominations that hate each other and so on. But if we look at the minerals and the worldwide, do you... 
do you see that we might be headed in this new multipolar system that 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 we see emerge around us? Do you see that we might be headed toward um, mineral wars or wars for minerals, wars for natural mm. resources? And if then where? Where are the hotspots that you are looking at in terms of politics and availability of things that others want? And you know your 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 vision is is wonderful. Of we need to co- collaborate in order to all prosper. The problem is that historically speaking, the West has been really good at collaborating by uh, enslaving everybody else, right? That's also a form of collaboration. It's just one where everybody else gets nothing and you get everything. And I, I am not very ha- uh, hopeful that they will change that model. Uh, they w- there will be coercion in order to get at the cheapest price possible what, um, the most thing you want. So which are the hotspots that you are looking at? Mm. Well, the I will start with the bad news and finish with the good news. <laughs> the bad news is that the war for mineral has already started years ago. <laughs> there is actually even, there are pieces of legislation in, in the EU and even in the US that is called Conflict Mineral Regulation. I think in the US it's called the Dodd-Frank Act. Mm. And it is related to metals that are produced in Eastern Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi. And those metals are tin, tantalum, tungsten, and niobium. Gold is also often associated to that list of what is called conflict mineral. Uh, Tungsten is a a particular metal. It is used in the defense industry. Uh, Niobium also is quite a particular one because 91% of that also come from uh, one country in Brazil. Tantalum, it's two countries that represent about 70% of the production. It's Congo and Rwanda. So the war for minerals has already started. It's just that it is not the big corporations that are fighting for it. It is small rebel group in the forest. I mean, today people talk about the war in the Congo, which has been lasting for the past 20, 22 years. But it is not, I mean, the war that... Lumum, uh, that uh, Laurent Kabila started in the 1990s to overthrow Mobutu, that was a war with a political agenda. So the plan was you know, to walk down to the capital and take over the power. This armed group that I am talking about have been in the forest for 22, 25 years. They have no objective to leave the forest. There is no, poli- they don't have any political agenda. Their main goal is to, you know, scare people, make sure that people stay away from the money. And if you look at the map between the the, the mining sites, if you do a or if you if you do a um if you look at the layers between the mining sites and the areas where there are conflict, it's almost a, a matching map. Not all the mines of course, but it's almost a matching map. So basically the armed group control the trade route and you pay them a tax if they are not exploiting the mine themselves. And those minerals sometimes end up on the international market because it's really hard to know. Uh, an example that I often give is that, you know, if you go to the market and you buy a, a bottle of milk, you can read it says, you know, it's, it, that milk came from farm, yeah, you know, whatever farm name that is on that. If you take a cell phone, there are about eight different elements in a cell phone, metals. You can't know where this one gram of cobalt came from, where this one gram of tungsten came from. Tungsten also is used in cell phone. That's what makes your your cell phone vibrating. Mm. Uh Really? (laughs) Uh, So, you know, it's impossible to know when you look at one cell phone, you know, where is this cobalt coming from? Where is this tungsten coming from? Is it coming from a mine where, you know, they have to pay fees to the armored group to go and sell on the market. So the war, unfortunately, for the minerals has already started, not by, not directly by state actors, but maybe by their proxies, and also not necessarily by corporate, uh, by big corporate actors, but uh, people who in the end sell those products on the international market. And by the moment, you know, your cobalt or your, uh, sorry, your tungsten that's come from a conflict area is mixed with a tungsten coming from, you know, a, a mine in, in, in Malaysia or, 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 or Indonesia. It's melted together. You know, you don't know anymore where the product is coming from. 
So unfortunately, that were started. There are a piece of legislation that are that have been enacted and are being refined in order to help reducing the amount of uh, conflict mineral that end up on the international market. But very, very, very difficult task because there are so many of those mines, some that have no records in even government agencies in the country where uh, those metals are produced. Sometimes those products are mixed with products that are ethically produced. So in the end, it's really difficult. The more positive sides is, I think, we are we're dealing with global issues uh, at the moment. The energy transition, the question of climate, you know, you know, reducing CO2 emissions. And if we do not work together to solve those problems, it doesn't matter if, you know, Sweden or Norway, they decrease the CO2 output, they produce green energy, but at the same time, I don't know, Germany or Poland increase their CO2 output. You know, it's like one hand washing the other. So if we want to manage the decrease of CO2 emission and transition effectively to green energy, we need to take collective decision, collective measures so that people work together. Because otherwise, yeah, as I say, you know, is you know, you're pouring out water, someone else is pouring in water. So Yo. I am, I am, I wouldn't say I'm the most optimistic, but I'm full of hope that eventually we get to that. Your word in God's ear, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, I, I do hope it goes that route. I'm just afraid that. If we look back at this period in 40 years from now, we're going to shake our heads yeah. and say, like, yeah, we've been fooled again <laughs> uh, yeah. with whatever yeah. it is this time. Um, Jonathan uh, Hamisi, thank you very much for your time and for your explanation. This was fascinating. Thank you, Pascal.